Hello, I'm Jack Cush with the Baylor Research Institute. Today we're going to talk about adult stills disease. I'm going to start off talking about the history of adult stills disease. I figure what better way to start than with a patient. This is a patient I actually saw in 1983. TR is a 23-year-old white female admitted to the hospital with a five-day history of fever, rash, and a sore throat. She complained of daily or sometimes twice daily fevers up to 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. The fever was always preceded by the chills. She had a red rash over her trunk, neck, and arms. She complained of diffuse myalgias, wrist pain, and three days of abdominal pain and diarrhea. Her sore throat had been going on for two weeks. She had gone to her primary care doctor who gave her penicillin, but she developed a rash and the penicillin was discontinued. When you looked into her past medical history, she had a history of rheumatic fever at age 9 and numerous hospitalizations between the ages of 9 and 12 for several diagnoses, including rheumatic fever, arthritis, FUO, fever of unknown origin, and hepatitis. The review of systems was otherwise negative. During her hospitalization, she had lymphadenopathy, an enlarged spleen, uh, hepatomegaly, pleuritis and pericarditis, her white count rose from 20,000 to 40,000, and she had elevated liver enzymes. On the right, you can see that she had fusion of her wrists. So this is a gal who actually had juvenile onset systemic disease or uh, systemic onset juvenile arthritis, soja, but now it was recurring as an adult, and we call that adult stills disease. You can see here her fever pattern with spiking fevers going on initially, and then once she started on steroids, um, that the fevers became less frequent and less prominent. So this is defined as a systemic inflammatory disorder that affects kids and young adults, usually up to the age of 35. It is um, notable for its quotidian fevers, daily spiking fevers, an evanescent rash, arthritis, sore throat that starts at the beginning of the con condition, serositis, organomegaly, leukocytosis, and an exuberant acute phase response. There are no diagnostic tests or serologic tests for this condition, hence it is a diagnosis of exclusion and hence it is a syndrome. It is a, a condition that is um, notable for its systemic exacerbations with high fevers uh, and then or chronic arthritis, with, often with long disease-free intervals. When you compare this condition in the adults to that seen in the children, you can see that they're pretty much the same. This is a listing of the variants of juvenile arthritis that are seen, and on the bottom is the systemic variant. This makes up 20% of all children with the onset of arthritis. You can see it usually happens between the ages of 5 and 16 years. Males and females are equally affected. They tend to be ANA and rheumatoid factor negative, and they have the exact same manifestations as that seen in the adults with fevers and rashes, serositis, organomegaly, high white count sed rates, um, uh, CRPs, ferritins, and a chronic anemia. When you compare adults to the systemic onset JIA, JIAs as shown in this slide, you can see that they pretty much have the exact same manifestations across the board. Um, 90 plus percent have the spiking fevers. 90 plus percent will have the evanescent rashes. 90 plus percent will have the arthritis, which is usually a polyarthritis. They may, the prodromal sore throat is something that distinguishes the two. Very common in adults, about 70, 75 percent, whereas in kids, it's only about 15 percent. As you can see, even on the bottom, the genetics are roughly the same. The um, bad part about this condition is it does run the risk of developing a chronic severe arthritis, which can be erosive and damaging in up to one-third of cases. This is George F. Still. This is a picture of him, uh, and, and, and this condition bears his name. Uh, it's because in the late uh, 1800s, George F. Still, who was working in England at the time, uh, described a set of children who had this condition, many of whom had systemic features, including the, the fever, the lymphadenopathy, the anemia, uh, and whatnot. He did not describe the rash. Um, and again, a lot of what was considered in his 22 ki kids was that of just simple juvenile arthritis of the posse and polyarticular type. But a subset of those 22 actually had this systemic variant that now bears his name. The history of this condition actually really starts in adults in 1971 by this seminal paper from Eric Bywaters in Annals of Rheumatic Disease wherein he describes um, 14 um, females with this condition um, and they had um, what was later known to be adult onset Stills disease. But even before 1971, there actually have been numerous reports of Stills disease in the literature. Going back to 1896, Bannatyne and Chauffard actually described 
prescribe patients with a systemic onset to their rheumatoid arthritis, meaning they had fevers and lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly and, 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 um, and, and anemia, and that's what distinguished them. Again, in 1897, George Still describes 22 patients with Still's disease in kids, um, and a subset of those had the systemic variant. In 1933, there were reports in the literature of the Still's rash, this evanescent rash being described for the first time, and then Otto Mulkey in a Scandinavian journal of rheumatology describes Still's disease in adults also in 1933. If you look in the French literature in 1943, they had this, the, a similar syndrome that was called subsepsis hyperallergica or the Whistler-Fanconi syndrome. And these are patients who really also have Still's disease. But again, the condition takes off in 1971 with Bywater's description of 14 females with an adult onset of this disease. And then in 1973, uh, Joseph Bujak and colleagues at the NIH described 10 males, all young, all with the same disease uh, and their and systemic manifestations. I think the next big benchmark was in 1976, Tom Metzger and Wallace Christie described the association of carpal ankylosis with Stills disease. That's a brief history of this condition. You can see by the publication reports shown here that there was very little in 1971 and 1975, one or two pay, uh, reports a year. Now in 2012, we're seeing an, on average about 60 to 70 new reports of adult Stills disease and a much greater number if you talk about Stills disease in general that includes children. So this has become a very popular condition. It's a common test question on medical board exams. Um, it always is brought up in any patient who may have fever uh, and arthritis and the diagnosis is still uncertain. You can see from this uh, graph that there really is a worldwide distribution. This does not only affects males and females equally, this affects pretty much all races in all countries. So this could be considered almost in every corner of the United States. How common is this condition? That's shown here. You can see that in the top half, um, the number of uh, Stills disease cases per year is roughly one to two cases a year in most major medical centers um, that have been in, in the literature. In the bottom half, you can see the, re the percentages in which Stills disease makes up the proportion of patients with fever of unknown origin in large cohorts, two to th 400 patients described with fever of unknown origin. What percentage of those actually have Stills disease? You can see it's consistently somewhere around five to six percent in many of these reports which makes it the number one autoimmune cause for fever of unknown origin. In fact, if you now look at the epidemiology of this condition, this is a rare, rare, rare condition with an event rate of somewhere between of around 0.16 uh, cases per 100,000 patient years. Uh, that means that in Dallas, Texas, where I live, we might expect to see around 19 cases per year. Um, so it's not that rare. It will occur in most major medical centers about one a year in the least. To end, we could say that this is a, a leading autoimmune cause of fever of unknown origin. It does cause considerable morbidity. Um, uh, it generally is not a condition that kills people. It just causes a lot of discomfort, a lot of disability. There is a large need for very aggressive therapies, including high-dose steroids. Um, the management of the disease usually involves the use of immunosuppressive and biologic agents. It is costly. It is a diagnostic challenge. Um, and often the treatment is not that clear to those who don't see many of these patients. These patients will, over time will require frequent hospitalizations to diagnose their condition or to manage their fevers. Um, weight loss can be a problem. It can be complicated by the macrophage activation syndrome, a very serious complication. And again, somewhere around a third of the patients will develop a severe erosive, if not deforming arthritis. Hence, this can be a real diagnostic challenge. In our next segment, we'll talk about the manifestations of Stills disease.